when I started investigating tree decline in Mount Eliza, I had no idea that it would extend into this huge, but virtually unexplored field of research, which is to look at the ecology of this region at the very highest level in a holistic way, not previously attempted. Um, you know, we know that around the world that um, predators are very important in controlling their prey in limiting prey numbers. We know the Yellowstone example well. And indeed, wherever it's been looked for around the world, it's been found in Eurasia, Africa and South America. And indeed, it applies in Southeast Australia equally as much. But of course, here in Southeast Australia, we have a motley crew of predators. We, we're missing two of our biggest, they've already gone due to human causes. So they're the four large mammalian predators. We have, and only one is native. The other three are alien, or as I prefer to say, novel, which is an unbiased, non-emotive term. This is all written up um, in various um, papers and journals, as you can see. And indeed, um, this year, a paper in the VicNet has come out, uh, and that is embedded within the web paper, which is the last reference there. The web paper is, has five times the detail of the VicNet paper, if you want to explore this subject further. It's rather challenging to keep this talk to 30 to 45 minutes, but it means that I'll have to um, fly through some of the slides, but they're, but they're largely graphic, so um, hopefully you will keep up and enjoy our little um, indulgence in the ecology of Southeast Australia. Um, and, and if you have questions along the way, I'm, I'm happy to, and comments, um, I'm happy to, um, to go there as well. There are links to those two papers if you want to download them, read them at your leisure, in fact. Um, I can only sort of skim it, the subject today, but it, you'll find a lot more detail in those papers. Trophic ecology is the study of the feeding relationships among organisms in an ecosystem. And there we have a classic three-way relationship in Australia with the top predator, human, the meso-predator, dingo, and the herbivore prey, the red kangaroo. We tend to think of the dingo as a top predator, but it is in fact a surrogate top predator. Aborigines preyed on dingoes, and both adults and pups. They sometimes saved some of the pups to keep as um, hunting dogs and camp dogs, but those animals, when they reached sexual maturity, always escaped into the wild, never to be seen again. So the dingo was not actually domesticated, but it was found to be useful by the couriers. Trophic ecology, um, really the modern form started with Charles Elton in 1927. He described the food cycle we now know as the food web. The ancient Greeks had actually discussed trophic ecology in their simple terms. But in terms of modern science, Charles Elton is um, the founder of the science. Some important contributions came later, particularly Hairston, Smith and Slobodkin with the green world hypothesis, in which they um, postulated that predators keep herbivores from destroying the Earth's vegetation. In 1969, Robert Payne, Bob Payne, discovered the keystone species concept. The keystone species benefits other species um, out of proportion to its biomass contribution to the ecosystem. It, uh, and it, it often is a predator that is a keystone species, but other species can become keystone as well. There's an ongoing dynamic between top-down control and bottom-up control of prey populations. And both top-down and bottom-up controls appear to operate in most populations. However, when it comes to large mammals, top-down control is clearly, clearly the more important of the two. 
There's various references in this growing field of trophic ecology, not so much for Australia, but for the rest of the world, and I do um, recommend Will Stolzenberg's book, as well as recent key papers listed there. There is a predator-prey cycle, you'll be aware of, that in, um, uh, it, it, it's a simple model of, of an ecosystem in which predators and prey undergo cycles, as per the graph there. Um, it, it does assume a one predator, one prey system, which is not often the case. It applies in Arctic zones and um, extreme environments, but typically in our temperate ecosystems, we have prey switching, and um, which means one prey species country predator switches to another species. And that tends to dampen the cycle, not eliminate it necessarily, but dampen it. And the other assumption is an unlimited food supply for the prey. And, well, if the predators suddenly go missing, the prey increases, all the food's eaten and the prey crashes. This has um, um, implications for management. Australia had a megafauna, um, and indeed the red kangaroo, technically the male at least, is still megafaunal. And of course the crocodile was the only megafauna species not really wiped out by humans. It was impossible for them to wipe out the crocodile, but of course it doesn't occur in the southeast of the continent, which is where our focus today. The, um, in fact, I'm talking about the Eastern Bassian Biogeographic Province. There are three provinces in Australia, the Teresian in the tropics and the Aryan in the arid interior of the continent. The marsupial lion is long gone, but it hunted giant um, herbivores, such as the uh, short-faced kangaroo. The uh, <clears throat> mammals of Australia have, been, have undergone many extinctions. It would appear that the first people wiped out over 50 species. The double the number that the Europeans wiped out. And this pattern of human impact on naive faunas occurs in other continents, of course, in, in, particularly in the Americas, as you know. Also in Eurasia, to some extent. It's interesting that the Neanderthals didn't wipe out the mammoth, however. It took the modern human to do it. So, with the loss of over 50 species of mammal, let alone other uh, animals, we, the Aborigines created a novel ecosystem a novel ecosystem is an ecosystem influenced or created by human beings. So there was an Aboriginal novel ecosystem for some 50,000 years. And that's the ecosystem that we know and love because it is so diverse, even though it's missing many of its original species. And in particular, it's missing Thylacalia, which we could really do with now because of the sand idea. But um, Thylacalia was a massive creature and uh, the thylacine was the, the, the next largest, and unfortunately it was wiped out by Europeans, as you know, to, pre to create the European novel ecosystem, which is the one we have today. Most of the flora and fauna of Australia have survived this transition to novel predators. Relatively few species have gone extinct, despite them being... So the major top predators of this region are listed there. I'm also um, on this table um, indicating the species that occur in the Gippsland Plain bioregion of Victoria. Victoria has some 28 bioregions, each of which has its own distinctive trophic ecology. And this is the Gippsland Plain shown here, but also in the context of the entire predator fauna. The thylacine and devil are on the table only because they are or were effective top predators in remote areas seldom visited by humans, such as wet forest and rainforest. But out in the Gippsland Plain by region, they were mesoprenators. They were hunted by Aboriginal people. In fact, the Aboriginal people had to hunt them because they were very dangerous animals. And um, there are reports in the Otways of um, Aboriginal people having to hide in trees from packs of dingoes. So it's, you can imagine how dangerous it would be um, to have wild dogs. Not only, not only do they compete with your prey, for, the, for, for your prey, that they are dangerous. 
And so the Aborigines um, use dingoes to help find dingo litters and eat them and or perhaps save one. The, uh, it was essential that the Aborigines control the dingoes and they only barely managed to control them. So the top predator, of course, the ultimate predator was the human, a ground-based predator. These, um, these gentlemen here, are in, uh, some of them are in brush tail um, possum skin cloaks. And the, one, the gentlemen seated, seated are in blankets, indicating the transition, the end of hunting of the possums. Those spears are not hunting spears, they are war spears, because they're seven foot long with barbs. The hunting spear was five foot long. They'd already, the hunting spears are not even in this photo, they've already stopped hunting. Kangaroo. And, um, but the war spear they keep carrying. So imagine, Life as a, as a Kuri man, you had to carry a war spear and hunting spear all the time. The women, of course, were significant predators, of course. So now the top predator, Dingo. You know, Will Wright, he wrote of the fauna of the Melbourne area in the 1850s. And he noted that it was actually throughout the whole country, the Dingo. Indeed, this photo shows it in a swamp. They hunted in all environments, including wet forest. They were everywhere. The powerful owl is and remains a top predator. It's um, vulnerable in Victoria due to the loss of tree hollows, large trees in which to nest. Uh, a major predator of eastern ringtail possum. Now below top predators, we have mesopredators. So a mesopredator can be killed by um, a, a larger predator at any stage of its life cycle. And these are the major mesopredators of Southeast Australia. And you can see that um, their status in Victoria is not particularly good, particularly the larger ones. Yes, the echidna is a mesopredator. Unfortunately, we lost our quolls, tragically. The eastern quoll was wiped out by disease during the uh, epidemic of, two, uh, of 1901 to 1903, which annihilated many marsupial populations, still unexplained to this day, thought to be perhaps canine distemper. Swat tail quoll was persecuted by Europeans as well as the eastern quoll, and today is very small possibly inbred populations. The swat tail quoll is a mid-storey dependent species. It hunts in mid-storeys. It can't really survive out in the open because of dingoes, naturally. It, it actually needs mid-storeys to find its prey, which are birds and possums, and to evade its primary predator, which is the dingo. providing quality control. The Terminator, Eastern Quoll. Will Wright found it to be one of the commonest of all the bush animals. Can you imagine that? What was it eating? Presumably large numbers of native rats and smaller prey, including invertebrates. It can, it can actually attack animals up the size of rabbits. The kookaburra is still secure, fortunately, but I thought it doesn't really prey on possums and our mammalian herbivores. Um, the lace monitor, I do worry about this fire at Bunya because it's just too extensive in relation to this animal, which really is, would um, suffer from fires, I'm sure. Um, but uh, that's the nearest occurrence to him now. But even then, Will Wright thought it was only in remote areas. I don't know whether that's due to hunting, because he was there some 20 years after the settlement of Melbourne. Um, the in East Gippsland, the, the staple um, diet of the uh, goanna is ringtail possum. It's rather easy for them to capture because they just have to crunch on the dray that's their nest up in a shrub. It's venomous, so the animal either 
falls to the ground and is taken later by the, by the Galena, or is not let go of. I'm not sure how it does it, but it is um, the primary food source for the lace monitor. The tiger snake also hunts in a similar way. It venomates, it bites through the dray, envenomates the possum, then retreats and waits for the possum to fall down. So, we do need herbivores actually in ecosystems to control vegetation cover, otherwise we get too much um, grass and shrub cover, so we need kangaroos and wallabies, etc. to regulate and control the amount of vegetation cover to enable the full plant diversity. However, in, in, there are certain herbivores that become um, overabundant given lack of predator pressure in open free-range populations, and these are those species. Their original predators were native plus dingo and human, but their current predators are actually novel predators. And where that predator pressure can't operate or is impeded, we get an overpopulation, which leads to an imbalance, which is defined as um, the loss of species diversity on a given site. The predator explosions of the region are quite interesting that they inform us about the trophic ecology um, because we find consistent and very um, strong effects of predator exclusion within these explosions. It's consistent and predictable, as we'll see shortly. There are eight of them in the region. Hamilton Community Gardens is an exception to the others in that they have controlled herbivores from the outset because they learned from uh, Woodlands Historic Park actually and that is a well-managed exposure to this day. The herbivores are physically coupled and that enables the eastern bug bandicoot population to thrive there. But the others, they don't, they haven't consistently controlled herbivores so we do see the effects of herbivore overabundance. And this is a summary of the herbivore damage. Um, we haven't got time to go through it, but uh, you will see, find all of this in the VicNet paper and indeed the web paper. What happens is what I describe as a predator loss ecological dysfunction syndrome. Um, in which these symptoms occur, we get an increase in grazers and browsers and loss of herbivore conditions, sometimes death by starvation, loss of trees, shrubs, ground layer, orchids, habitat for other fauna, increase in exotic vegetation and accelerated soil erosion. So the example at, at Woodlands Historic Park is ample demonstration of the role of predators in ecosystems. The ongoing loss of um, mature and immature trees to possums and the stripping of the ground layer by wallabies, kangaroos and rabbits in particular um, combined to make an ecological disaster. It'll take centuries to get live living trees of this size back on the site and, and there hasn't been any regeneration of canopy trees since the explosion was started. Even the eastern barred bandicoot is in very low numbers now because of the heat stripping of the understory which means that um, raptors can take them. So at, even it's even failed in its own terms which is to, to provide a, a haven for the eastern barred bandicoot. Um, Cross-fence comparisons indicate that uh, outside the exposure in the quote predator landscape um, we have continuous canopy tree recruitment, more ground layer vegetation cover. This is the outside the fence, that's the predator mm -hmm. landscape of South East Australia that we just, we take for granted, we don't, we're blind to it, I was for many decades. I thought I understood ecology for, for 30 years and I didn't. Because we take it for granted that there's a trophic balance operator. We, we don't realise that it is. But when the trophic balance is upset, we, we see the effects of excess herbivory and it's devastating. 
Here they've attempted to re re reintroduce native grass understory inside a plot within the park. Um, these are planted um, wallaby grasses and, and rue grass. Interestingly, this fence allows kangaroos in, which are not destroying it, although these plants are probably unable to flower. Um, but the rabbits would appear to be far worse looking outside that plot, because that's a combination of all the hurdles, but the rabbit is probably the worst of them. So the Briars Wildlife Sanctuary of Mount Mars is similar, the loss of canopies, many guns in this case. That's nice. We're underneath a um, accumulating move. Um, so uh, they've, they've had to actually protect some of the trees internally with tree bands because I pointed it out to the site manager that they were about to lose large numbers of mature trees due to the increase in population uh, uh, density, a wintile possum in particular. So they've, they've saved some of the trees with possum bands. So the Briars Wildlife Sanctuary is a, it's a, a valuable area of remnant vegetation that was accidentally thrown into crisis by an electrified predator fence in 2013. They, despite advice, they did not uh, collect any pre-treatment monitoring data to enable um, full quantitative analysis of the effects. In fact, the only site that has pre-treatment data is Mulligan's Flat, where Sue McIntyre et al. took some excellent data. Um, inside the briars, the only way they can get any uh, new trees to survive is through a fencing off the trees, and even orchids are devastated and need to cage them. So what we have with the predator exposures, the outcomes of them can be seen as an informal replicated experiment. At each site, before the exposure, the novel predators were the major ground predators. The dingo was already extinct. And of course, Aboriginal hunting had long ceased. Herbivores were in balance with predator limited populations, and vegetation and habitats were relatively healthy, including tree canopies. So the exposures exclude ground predators only. Aerial predators still have access. So the raptors can still take their prey, but they don't stop these effects manifesting, so indicating that the raptors are not even the powerful owl, which is present at some of these places, is not enough on its own. The result is the predator loss ecological dysfunction syndrome, unless the herbivores are managed. And the conclusion I relatively came to was that novel ground predators maintain ecosystem health and stability over large parts of Southeast Australia. When I realised this, I was truly shocked because I, like everyone else, have been educated to despise these predators. And I must admit, even today, I recoil at the sight of a cat in the bush, but the fox I, know, I now accept and understand its role. And now that we know that the fox is so important, in ecosystems, I think the animal rights and welfare issues in relation to fox control are more prominent. Phillip Island is an example of predator exclusion gone wrong at the landscape scale, massive loss of trees. They've attempted to eradicate the fox from the island um, and they've got it down to less than 10 animals. The result is devastation. They should have and, uh, just controlled cats at the penguin colony and would have been far cheaper and far less damaging to the island's ecology. But no, they've, they've gone, they've gone, they've jumped in boots and all here, unfortunately. No monitoring, and it's just a disaster. I really pity Philip Island. Right, the black wallaby is a case study, and we know about at Cranbourne and how it's increased significantly. And I'm sure Terry can elaborate and he has spoken on it a number of times.
talks, and I won't go there now. But this phenomenon of quality overpopulation, it, it has occurred in exactly the same way at Korenberg Bushland Reserve, as documented by De Monk in 1999. And they found that in an open free-range population at Jervis Bay, Boudoury National Park, it's caused depth, the intensive fox control has caused a tenfold increase in black wallaby. And it's been devastating. Um, and this has been written up, fortunately, by Dexter et al. And McGregor spoke about it on Radio National. And recently, Lyndon Mayer et al. published. They have, this fox control apparently caused a collapse in the native mammal fauna. Five species have plummeted there, including greater glider. So you know the old old maxim, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What was happening there before they started the fox control was um, a balanced ecosystem. The predator naive species, in the, which are relatively few, had long gone, and we had we'd had decades or a century of stability there. Now, yeah, so it's great for the bristle bird, and you know there were the odd benefits. Some species benefit from this fox control, which is why they persevere with it, but I think the costs are too great. Um, the koala is a really sad case of, of um, overpopulation at Cape Otway and elsewhere in Victoria. At Cape Otway, koalas were reintroduced in 1981, but without their predators, which are... Um, can anyone suggest what the predators of koalas are? Dingoes and... Humans. Yeah, without their predators, they soon. It takes about 20 years, according to Peter Minkos, for this phenomenon. It consistently occurs. And uh, tragically, they've wiped out this very significant Managum population. This is the only Managum that's adapted to alkaline soils. It's a particular genotype and a beautiful ecosystem that I knew and I mapped it in, for the Arthur Island Institute in the 1980s. It's devastated today. And, and this is the start, the, the koalas have starved in large numbers, prompted euthanasia programs. The common brush tailed possum. Michael O'Brien discovered that in northern Victoria, when he put possum bands on red gums, they survived. He was being told, like the paradigm up there, was that it was climate change causing the death of trees. He suspected otherwise. He did an experiment and proved that it was possums. Now, when I, I've had discussions with Mike, why did the possums increase? It's because he, there were diligent fox controlled by himself and his neighbours over years. Whenever they saw a fox, they got out the rifle and shot it. And during the millennium drought, fox numbers were lower anyway, because fox, drought is a significant cause of mortality for red fox. So today, he allows the foxes, and he's found that the foxes take only a few lambs per year, whereas the Australian raven takes hundreds. The Australian raven is a very serious lamb predator, far more important than the red fox. And his red gums are healthy, those that, that survived have regained their health. At La Trobe Uni Wildlife Sanctuary, um, of which I am a co-author of the management plan, we saved the two large red guns with possum bands there. Um, I saved a tree at Temple Spur on Fitzsimmons Lane. You may know the giant tree there. It was about to die, I kind of saw. And Michael Trigonin has commented that all it required was a piece of plastic. It is quite a buzz to save a 200 year old tree with a piece of plastic. So the fact that red gums and free-range populations of, of possums and foxes are still vulnerable means that the balance is very precarious. The foxes only barely manage to control this predator, this herbivore. And there are no practicable alternatives to the red fox. We're fortunate to have it. It was fortunate that it was introduced. It's an amazing... So the eastern ringtail possum is a a major herbivore causing massive tree decline in parts of um, southern Victoria. 
On that tree in the picture, the, the, uh, the limb on the right is unprotected and died. And I've got several examples of trees that one limb is protected and, and, and saved, clearly showing that it's possum causing it's a primary decline. Um, so um, the, the bushland reserves of the northern Warnings Peninsula and in the middle section are basically stuffed now. They're, um, they've lost their canopies and they won't be getting them back anytime soon. And, and it's linked to dense mid-stories. This is a phenomenon of the canopy decline caused by winter possum linked to dense mid stories. Can anyone suggest why that might be? It took me a while to realise. Because if you ban the trees, they survive. It's not competition with the mid story. These trees are being eaten back, they're not just dying back. When the dense mid story develops, and that's our natural structure, we know from early survey plans that this was an open woodland. And um, with the dense mid story, which is quite natural, uh, the possums can evade the foxes, the only remaining predator in the system, by not coming to the ground. They avoid the ground. And that's it. That's... These dense mid stories are very bad for plant diversity anyway, and they're a massive fire hazard. So this is due to land mismanagement. Well, now it's been pointed out it is now land mismanagement. So um, the Mornington Shire investigated the problem after all and got independent corroboration by, from Ecology Australia. It is in fact tree decline, not die back, because the trees are eaten back, they don't die back. But they confirm that the prognosis of the eucalypt remaining in the landscape is extremely poor. Basically, the reserve, bushland reserves are stuffed in that part of the world, and um, it's rather discouraging, but um, I find it in, a very interesting that we've actually solved the problem. But, I not only solved the problem, but I've, I've just explored this, I found this totally unexplored field of research, the trophic ecology of this region. It's huge and seldom studied. Um, so the Shire started banning trees, they've banned hundreds of trees. Now this is an example of a tree that was saved in Mount Eliza by possum bands. This is the distribution of ringtail possum associated decline or RPAD in this part of the world. Each red dot represents 10 or more sick or dead or dying trees. But uh, it's not just where the dots are, it's all throughout. They're just sites, typical sites of Ecuador. It extends beyond this region into the Bellarine Peninsula and beyond. Now, Eastern Ring Possum damage, or ARPA, is readily diagnosed. There's an elegant diagnosis. The new leaves are eaten and the hanging branches are intact because possums don't climb down branches, regardless of their height above ground. So you can make elegant diagnoses of mammal, uh, her, mammal, mammalian herbivore damage. Koalas do the same thing, but there are no koalas in this region, or at least not in numbers. And indeed, the brush tail possum and the, and the ring tail possum have different browse patterns. The brush tail possum feeds on adult leaves primarily. It's got different um, teeth that are adapted to cutting and grinding hard, mature eucalypt leaves. The ring tail goes for the shoots, having much smaller teeth. That's why the two species can actually cohabitate. They actually have different niches. Even though they're the same food plant species, it's just different stages of growth on the planet that enables the two species to live together. So, ringtail possum associated decline is a syndrome, they're the um, symptoms. So, on the Monge Peninsula, we have a novel ecosystem where the original predators of the eastern ringtail possum, or Kuri Beman, have been replaced in, in part by the red fox and cat, but we don't have any aerial or arboreal predators to, to control the possums in those dense stories. That's why the tree line is occurring. 
So these novel predators, they catch possums on the ground changing food trees. But without the top predator, dingo, they are subject to mesopredator release, or potentially are, which can further reduce fauna populations. So a mesopredator without its top predator may increase, and which increases the impact on small prey, which can be quite negative. We don't want, so we want fox to control cats. Is, the evidence that fox control cats is somewhat at um, Ambilden, but I think most people appreciate that there, there probably is um, a major controlling effect. We don't really want lots of cats. We want them to be controlled by foxes because cats are going to be better at capturing the antikinus and the small fauna than the foxes. So I developed a trophic management model to stop tree decline on the, on the peninsula. And you can see that only one management pathway has a positive outcome for all management variables. And that is by interrupting the mid story and having ground predators. Once you've done that, possums are in balance, you have a canopy, you have a ground layer, and there are examples, many examples of each of these pathways that you can test if you wish, and see for yourself. How do we interrupt the mid-story? I think it's through a combination of fire and physical control. The wallaby once provided some significant contribution to this as well. But the wallaby, unfortunately, can't survive in small members below about um, 80 hectares, with too small. But the wallaby survives in larger remnants. Um, okay, with the fox, they're in the predator-prey balance. In fact, the wallaby spread into Western Victoria and from starting from around the 1970s in the presence of the fox. Uh, it's a curious phenomenon. So the, what the, the fox and the wallaby are in stable predator-prey balance from that in remnants of 100 hectares or more. It's mainly the emergent pouch shelling they feed on, so an adult wallaby is pretty much nice prey for a fox, but the emergent pouch shelling. Same with kangaroos, the, the foxes limit kangaroo numbers slightly, but significantly by preying on the emergent pouch shelling, obviously not the adult. Um, so over the years I've developed um, possum banding techniques, and you can look up these tips here if you want you to do it yourself. Another herbivore that could maybe come over abundant uh, is the swamp rat. And we saved the last dainty wasp orchid colium analyzer in the nick of time from these swamp rats with a wire cage. But the wire cage itself poses problems. Um, it attracts attention um, from people um, and it impedes mm -hmm. management of the grassy vegetation under the mesh and also. Um, prevents blue tongue lizards accessing the site to control the invertebrate predators of the orchids. So these orchids, you can see on the, on the, rock, the right photograph, it's, that is, those leaves are chewed by invertebrates. I realise that blue tongues actually, they, they search every square metre of the bush. And that's why we don't have the garden style helix dispersor everywhere. And other uh, predators, but mainly the blue tongue. Uh, and and I, that's why I say, if it hasn't got blue tongues, it's not working. It is a keystone species. But there are many other possible trophic imbalances. It's just poorly studied. The noisy minor problem may in fact be due to that. There are some 20 uh, predators, nest predators of noisy miners in Australia. Very few are in the Melbourne area, uh, which may explain in part or entirely why we have this overabundance of them. But it's interesting to note that real right notice they were abundant his day, so you know, maybe they are naturally abundant in open vegetation, and we should just get used to them. But there are other mysterious declines due to bore, as we know, poorly understood, but there's likely to be a relationship with um, um, cockatoos, the glossy black cockatoos extinct on the peninsula, um, which might have controlled um, borers in she oaks. And um, also parasitoid wasps may be missing from the equation. This is the trophic structure of the Southeast Australian novel ecosystem. The novel species are in orange. So at any particular site, um, a number of food chains um, occur, not all these species occur at every site. So a number of 
individual food chains mesh to become a food web. Now, an example is Mount Eliza, which is a simple ecosystem in which the fox is the top predator. It's kind of shocking, isn't it, to think of it? It should be powerful owl and, and swap-tailed quoll in even those dense mid stories. Uh, but it's not there, they're globally extinct. There are a number of management approaches. We can use this information now to actually improve um, conservation management um, to make it more interesting, effective, and efficient. We can learn to read the bush, which is to observe levels of browsing and grazing in all vegetation layers and look look out for live animals, tracks, scats and remains. I now read the bush, uh, or if you are a governor. I used to stare at the ground looking at the, the plant diversity. And, um, but I, I do that still, but I now look at the big picture everywhere. I, I, I've learned to, you can tell the levels of browsing and grazing of all vegetation layers almost at a glance. You can work out what's there, what's causing it. With, and uh, it's really quite interesting way to understand the bush and appreciate the bush in a new way. Now, tree canopy loss is, is preventable. It's human induced and due to land mismanagement. Up to this point in time, yes, it's due to misunderstanding of ecology. Um, but now, from, now that we understand the trophic ecology of this region, any further tree canopy loss is due to mismanagement. This has major implications. Uh, we should be aware of the complexity of uh, predator ecology and feral animal control and anticipate and look for ecosystem responses. Manage rather than necessarily eliminate novel predators where they control herbivores. Avoid fox control in novel bushland ecosystems that otherwise lack vertebrate crown predators due to the adverse effects of herbivore release and cat release. Except consider strategic <coughs> predator control where populations of listed threatened fauna are suppressed by predators in combination with monitoring of canopy health sensitive plant populations and other ecological factors. Now, this, uh, this, the way that foxes are controlled in bushland is rather done, it's done rather in a paradigmatic way. Um, it's not a lot of thought put into it. People think they are, quote, saving the bush. But with, and, and, and the, the positive role of foxes in ecosystems has been rarely um, studied, but is occasionally discovered accidentally. For example, with the Mallee fowl, um, Walsh et al. found um, which includes Joe Benjamin, the ex an expert on mallee Foxes are positively correlated with mallee conservation and that it was bad to control foxes. It's a powerful example of why management decisions should be based on evidence rather than ecological intuition. So there we see a lot of mallee on the roadside there. Their prob the problem with the mallee is not nothing to do with the fox. It's to do with the lack of mature, old-growth mallee vegetation. That's it. And there's not enough of that. Too many fires, both deliberately lit and lightning strikes, are a real problem for this bird, not for foxes. Um, can anyone suggest why foxes might be positively correlated with mallee fowls? What, what is it about foxes that... Yes, that's one of the theories. They control cats, which, and also they control goats, which compete for the food of the many fowl. The goats eat the shrubs that provide the seed, the food for the many fowl. And also, possibly, foxes are negatively correlated with dingoes, because dingoes hunt down and kill foxes. They can't eliminate them, but they can lower their numbers. Um, maybe dingoes are better predators of many fowl. So the many, we want to. With this animal we really want to protect it because we lost the giant mallee fowl to the first humans. The, it was, it was presumably too large a, a, a target that humans could find their mounds and easily wipe them out, but the smaller mallee fowl mound is less, more easily hidden in the bush. So certainly we, we 
have evidence that mallee fowl are preyed on by foxes, but they are in a stable prey-to-prey balance. Bear in mind that, a, say, a mallee fowl female produces some 200 eggs in her lifetime, of which only two survive to maturity in a stable population. The other 198 die early, and this has been happening for millions of years. And what do they die from? It's heat stress and predators, in the case of the mallee fowl. But we can look at, um, say, the ringtail possum, the typical female produces an average of 10 young in her lifetime. Only two have to make it to maturity in a stable population. The other eight die young in a stable ecosystem. It's been happening for millions of years, and just because predators are seen taking them means nothing in culture. We cannot just panic at the sight of predator and prey. It's part of nature. Um, you know, 90% of David Attenborough is prey, predator interactions, isn't it? 90 over 90% of David Attenborough is prey. It's the drama of nature. It goes on everywhere. Get used to it. The fact that few herbivores survive their predators. Even if they make it to maturity, they may be picked off when old and weak. And we don't find visibly starved animals or carcasses in the bush in, in free-range populations exposed to predators, so indicating that starvation is not usually a major cause of mortality. We consider other management approaches, which is to um, reducing overabundant herbivores by culling, disease, contraception, habitat modification. We should continue to protect large trees, but this is a band-aid measure. These, these bands only last five years and have to be replaced. Um, what we need is a um, set and forget management approach. We, we not depend on funding and interaction on a permanent basis. Set and forget management. And that is to ensure that the trophic ecology is operational. I think we should annoy, avoid nest boxes for possums where they threaten canopy trees. And also the release of possums where the habitats are already saturated with possums. It's futile and increases animal suffering. I really do think animal shelters should take this on board. And which is why I do have some, um, I have critics among animal shelter people. But um, just because they love interacting with possums, we'd all love to interact with, with little baby animals, you know. But you're doing it at the expense of the animal. Um, tracking studies have shown that these animals don't survive in the wild. Um, so um, we should review the protected status of possums in certain areas and consider their culling as an emergency measure in significant areas. We should manage the woodlands back towards their relatively open structure through biomass reduction to prevent common ringtail possum and overpopulations. So on this, um, this survey plan with George Smythe, there are some incredible descriptions. He's written good country, good grass, good soil, good grass, lightly wooded, open country, good grass, timbered with gum, she ate light wooden wattle tree. There was only one area in the, in the, in the northwest Munich Peninsula that had dense forest that was on the Mount Eliza Escarpment with the annotation forest lane clay soil, very scrubby, no grass. That is where the spot tail qual occurred, we know, from historical reports. What happened there, however, was that in the 1930s, the chicken farmers from the Murdoch Plain, they uh, undertook a, a, a sweep through the um, escarpment and annihilated the uh, dens and the, and the, uh, and the quail, quails themselves. Yeah, so they were deliberately uh, eliminated by chicken farmers. Because, you know, the quoll does actually, if you can get into a chicken coop, it'll kill a lot. It's one of several predators that show surplus the killing of prey. Uh, it's not just the fox uh, and the dog that exhibit surplus killing of prey under, under the right conditions. A lot of them do it. Um, the feral cat's not known to do it, however. And that's possibly because it will be dangerous for it to do it and it doesn't find the concentrations of, animal, of prey animals. So um, we need to prevent herbivore imbalance in side predator exposures by perhaps reintroducing native predators. Hardly practical because the home range of a dingo exceeds the size of any of these exposures. And then you'd have inbreeding in the dingo. 
if you, so they'd kill all of your precious animals. Um, and then it's below their home rate, they'd starve. So it's not really feasible. Controlling herbivores is, is much more practical. And maybe consider creating the exposures in reef edge where it's not easy to damage the site. There's been a tendency in mammal conservation to, to pick the most valuable remnant of native vegetation in a local area and then accidentally ruin it. It is possible to manage these herbivores, but uh, you will need to understand how to go about it. Um, we should support well planned and viable reintroductions of native predators. The, the, the devil is a, a candidate. However, I am concerned it, about it. Um, it Firstly, it can't really survive for the dingo, apparently. So there's large areas of the mainland not suitable for the devil. Okay, and there's Wilson Promontory, perhaps, where there are no dingoes but anymore. But um, most of the mainland Australia are not suitable in the long term for the devil. The dingoes kill the devils, it would appear. Um, but the devil is a beautiful fox killer, so that's why the fox has not been able to establish in Tasmania, because the, the, the devils go down the dens and eat the cubs. But to introduce Australia, it's got another, uh, mainland, it's got another problem. I don't think that the devil is as good at, at controlling brush tile possums as is the red fox. Because in Tasmania, we have significant tree declines being documented in the presence of devils and quolls. Quite a serious issue. So we should take measures to protect native, vegeta uh, native predators and allow these keystone species to perform their vital ecological role. And finally, I propose that we adopt a new paradigm. We end the anti-predator paradigm, which is obsolete, counterproductive to conservation and expensive. And adopt a trophic paradigm, which is in which every ecosystem has its predators. Let's make them native where possible. We should adopt a trophic model of ecosystem function. And our mission is to optimise Australian biodiversity and novel ecosystems. Think trophically, act locally, good luck and good management. Thank you. So we're running out of time, but if anyone's got any quick questions, please put up your hand now and we'll see if Jeff can deal with them. Neville. You mean defoliation of shrubs or, or trees? Yeah. Uh, can it be? Yeah. There is some decline even in, the, in, in our, our powerful owl roost areas. It's been noted by, pointed out to me by council officers. Um, the, the 100 acres also in um, Park Orchards, um, eastern Melbourne, the powerful yeah. owl is present, but the, the, the ringtail possums are still causing impacts. But um, there are powerful yeah. owls at, at Greensport Shed. That's why it's not as bad as it might be, but they're not apparently sufficient on their own. I actually um, um, managed to save 100 acres with bushland research. The tree canopy was dying from winter. No one would know this because the, the botanists look at the ground, the zoologists look at the birds, and no one's thinking about tree health. Now they've banded a lot of trees and proved that it was winter possible, and they've saved parts of the canopy now. So you, I suggest you go out and have a look at all your bushland reserves and see if you can see similar phenomena in that are waiting to, for you to come along and help protect the biodiversity there. Because if you don't get the, um, the trophy culture you're right, there's not much point in conservation, really. If, if that's so fundamental, you must get the trophy culture you're right in, in order to then entertain ideas of protecting the biodiversity. Tim? Um, do, you, do you see any parallels in, in vegetation? Yeah, I know it's the entirely different part of the mm. system, but the same sort of questions arise, don't they? Like, oh, it's a system, you know, species there we might not like, but sometimes they perform functions. Mm. Well, yes, I'm, I'm more accepting now of novel flora. Um, we know that, that 
um, like blackberries protect small birds in otherwise empty habitats. Um, um, gorse is providing essential habitat for the uh, southern brown bandicoot and kuru up area, along with kaikuyu grass. I think we, we have to become a bit more accepting of the novel flora and, um, and at the same time try to prevent its spread where it's not of any benefit, but, and also maintain living museums of the original flora and fauna as far as possible. I'm very strong about living museums now. And I don't mean the, natural, the museums, one, I mean real ones out there in the field. Like, I like, I'd like Crandon to be a living museum, you know, um, more so than it is now. Any, any more questions? Mm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, the whole trophic system is not there. They have a different trophic uh, um, topology there. It doesn't involve mammals. So these 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 mammalian herb predators controlling mammalian herbivores, it occurs around the world and it, it's independent of species. It doesn't matter. So you can replace one species with another. The rabbit can replace the betong, and the fox can replace the quoll or, or the devil. It, it's it's a worldwide phenomenon. The ecosystem mammals have to be in balance for, for the system to function at all. Where they occur, so New Zealand is different in that they are naturally absent. Any more? I'm getting the, the stunned mullet effect, which is often I often <laughs> get with, with this talk. Thank you, guys. But uh, people are pretty shocked by this and can't form my questions. So look, if you do have any questions or comments, please get in touch with me. You can get on the Spiffer website. You can actually email me. And I'm very open to challenges and refutations. I can't get them. I've given this talk 19 times, including to professionals. At the end. I can't get refutations. So I think that the model is fairly robust. The trophic model is fairly robust and the evidence is compelling. But nonetheless, I, am, I have an open mind on the subject and I'd like to be proved wrong. If you can, go ahead. Please, Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Wonderful, thank you. Well, and um, the plan is that we will save the PowerPoint presentation somehow and um, turn it into a video, hopefully. Uh, but that's a bit of a technical issue we've got to sort out. But we have been recording it, all the audio with today's talk. And so people will be able to review it if they want, go back and have a look at some of Jeff's slides. And uh, then our other colleagues, like at Cranman, hopefully will be able to get access to it too. So I'd really like to thank Jeff again for giving us that beautiful presentation. Thank you. And if anyone has any private things to raise with Jeff, I think it will be around for a few minutes after we finish. Thank you.